Hello, Ann Althaus. Hello, Bob Ray. How, How are, are you? I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm in the midst of a uh, crazy political vortex in Madison, Wisconsin, where I usually like to think of it as my remote outpost, far away from the things I'm observing. But, you know, yeah. I've, been the, I've been in this uh, crazy, crazy place. How about you? you know, it became... Became, it became the epicenter of liberal activism, and I, I, I gather you were only too happy uh, to make yourself the uh, token um, uh, nonconformist. Well, you know, when you've been writing about politics for seven years, from a distance, and suddenly a few blocks away, this huge thing is going on, you kind of have to show up. I mean, you know, do you remember how uh, Glenn Reynolds wrote a book called The Army of Davids, which was about yeah. how people would be all dispersed all over the world, and when something happened, they would then, with their video cameras and their blogs and so forth, um, mm -hmm. be participating. That's new media. Well, you know, I, I like to say uh, I got drafted, and, and uh, Mead and I got drafted into the Army of Davids. We mm -hmm. kind of had to do it because we were here. Yeah, because there's only two Davids in Madison, uh -huh. if not you, I in I that particular army. Davida. Yeah. If not you, who would stand up for your side of the argument? Um, well, it's not just so a question. It's not really about sides. It's there's something here to be seen, to be watched, and mainstream media doesn't do its job. Mainstream media really doesn't show it. And we're showing what, uh, what new media, we're kind of inventing as we go along what new media can be, what new media is. And you could say some of it is being biased and showing what one side has. But some of it is just, I'm going to observe, I'm going to take a lot of video and show the things. I mean, my theme in blogging has always been interestingness, what, what interests me. I don't mm -hmm. push a political agenda. I get perceived by people on the left as someone who is biased. But the reason for that perception, and remember, I voted for Barack Obama, and I mostly have voted for Democrats on all, all my voting years. Uh, the reason I'm perceived that way is because uh, people on the left are so alert looking for heretics. You're supposed to buy into the whole thing, and they will smoke you out and accuse you of being a traitor if you don't go along with everything. And that's why I'm perceived the way I am. Uh, the, the right doesn't do it that way. That's why I'm accepted on the right. I'm not a right winger or a left winger. But that's the way I'm perceived, and that says something about what the right and the left really are in this country. That's my it is a, it, it is a longstanding standing. Uh cliche almost that that the right looks for converts and the left looks for heretics and i've been pointing um, that out for the longest time that really is my personal story yeah i don't know if it's true but uh you can see the strategic superiority in the long haul of looking for converts <laughs> i know why is and, the left so yeah. dumb uh, you know, I, I actually don't have a, a position on whether it's even the, the case, this generalization, but it is, um, I mean, there's certainly something about, speaking of new media, you know, as this is another cliche by now, mm -hmm. but what I'm about to say, but uh, that, uh, that reinforces the kind of, you know, tribalistic kind of preaching to the choir, um, looking, for, uh, looking for heretics mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something about the Internet. It makes it very easy to form these little groups that behave in exactly that fashion. You certainly mm -hmm. see some of those on the right mm -hmm. uh, as well as the left. Mm -hmm. yeah. All of them, all of them have their kind of, uh, you know, uh, on both the right and the left, you can find these sites that, that you know, for example, I think Red State recently, uh, or months ago, formally banned, I think, birthers from the comment section. Well, you know, um, Mead got banned just the other day from uh, by one of Rob your one of, by Bob Farley, one of the blogging guys, because I, I Mead Kentucky questioned recently. him about Libya, which yeah. we're about to talk about. And some of the themes that I want to talk about here are the things that uh, Mead was raising over there that day when Bob Farley decided he just couldn't take it and, anymore, and, and not only found... banned Mead but obliterated all his past participation on that blog. It was mm -hmm. unbelievable. It was the I, I, my blog post about it was uh, candy ass blog remove of all time, and I stand uh -huh, by. I saw that post. Now Rob Farley, I've always found to be a perfectly congenial person. Why is it that your family can't get along with him, man? Because he's one of these uh, lefties who just can't take being challenged and has no yeah, sense I, of humor when somebody isn't part of the cocoon, part of the echo chamber. And that's what I experience here in Madison, Wisconsin, is that the people are so inside it, that they're so convinced of their goodness and their rightness, that they can't, mm -hmm. they, they can't relate to people outside of it. It's a terrible political liability, by the way, not to be able to talk to others. You know, you mentioned tribalism, and I couldn't help but think, for a month we had people occupying the Capitol here, and they were banging on drums and chanting. I mean, it was literally felt like the tribalistic... Uh, you know, there was a, a, a something that you had almost, to believe. It was chanted. Uh, almost it was, like almost like tea partiers at a at a, at a town meeting to talk about health care, like a year or two ago or something. 
Did they bang on drums and, and create a cacophony? I, I don't know what instruments they used. There, there were, you know, there were intentionally disruptive tactics used, as you may but recall. They were yeah, maybe, but they were questioning. They were with, trying with, to with get... With the expressed they, intention being to prevent people from talking at the meeting they had come to. If you go through my blog and go to the tag, uh, Wisconsin protests, and go through what we have, and we have it on video, we have the chants, we have the way people have been behaving, we have the signs. If you go through that and you tell me that that is equivalent to what the Tea Party, it is so far beyond it, the hatefulness, the cacophony, the exclusion of opposing viewpoints is so extreme, it's so far beyond anything that the left has been criticizing the Tea Party for for the last two years, that it's just ridiculous when the, uh, well, period. I don't know. I don't know if I would be persuaded. Uh, well, have you have you uh, looked through the last six blog on the tag of Wisconsin protests? I invite six, people to do six, Well, not all six weeks. Moreover, I, I am not equally conversant in what the Tea Party did anyway, so I couldn't make the comparison. You know, just quickly, did Rod Farley know that Mead was your husband when he did this? Oh, yes. Yes. He yes, did. Because I'm Mead good. has been going... So, it, so they it is been, like a family feud. That? You know, he's, no. in, Listen, he's in Kentucky. I think they still I, have family feuds. You know, feuds he's on there. the Internet. He's on the... Well, huh. Oh, are you are you going to be? Uh, is this uh, a bigot anti hillbilly bigotry? I knew you'd bring. No, I'm all, I'm for family feuds. We try to start them on blogging heads. It's a compliment to say that in some regions there are still family feuds. In that case, it was a joke. I doubt there yeah. are. But that blog, uh, but, I, but I'm, pro, guns, I'm pro family feud. That blog, Lawyers, and, Guns, and Money, has been uh, taking shots at me for the longest time. Very unsubstantive stuff. They act like they're more intelligent. Than we are, they mm -hmm. call, but they just uh, they just do name calling. They call me a drunk. They they lie Imagine about me. Imagine that. They, they call, you call a me drunk? stupid. They call me a drunk all the time. They act like they, they, they just have this meme over there about me that I'm a drunk, and they use that. Although they call me stupid, they don't really have subs. They've just been attacking well, me. So me has been you know going. You why? Up. They probably there is footage of you sipping wine on blogging heads. That's what probably started uh, oh, yeah. all. See, that's the kind of left wing attitude that really bugs me, this idea that, they, you know, they're puritanical. They're purists. I mean, you take a sip of one glass of wine and you become right. a drunk. That's right. like and the Rob most... Farley himself has never had a drink. I know. And <laughs> uh, I'm kidding because he has actually ha uh, been seen on blogging heads as well and vibing. So I don't think that's the problem between you and Rob Ann. I don't think it's an issue about alcohol. Actually, the, the, the blogging heads where they where I, where I look like I'm drinking wine, I'm drinking pomegranate juice. I just put well, it in Rob my Rob was really drinking, and, like, pirate grog or something, so he's ahead of you there. But but anyway... But that blog, the, uh, Mead has been going over there when they attack me. He would go into the comments to defend me. So that's the function mm -hmm. he played, uh, to try to call them on the kinds of things, really underhanded things that they were doing to me. Uh, mm -hmm. Rather than me blogging about it and giving them, encouraging them by giving them traffic, because if I link to them, you know, a thousand people will go over and read it, and so they get a benefit from attacking me. That's called punching up in the in the world of blogging. Punching up—that's kind of an insult to Rob. I mean, look at the Rob, numbers. Rob, Rob probably thinks of you as peers naively, but you're saying that in the that world you're at a level of blogging, above. it's about the traffic. And when you mm -hmm. want to try to get traffic, attacking someone who's got more traffic than you so that they'll link to you is a victory. Oh, I no see. No matter what they say. In a surely quantitative sense, you're a level above him. I see. Oh, um, I'm, I'm about 10 levels above him in, in quantitative. In qualitative, I'm also above him. But uh, that's a matter of opinion. Man. I don't need to argue that. I think it was a very, it was pathetic that he, he not only banned me, but deleted all the comments Mead had ever written. And Mead really is careful about the comments that he wrote. And many of those things were challenging them. I feel like they just, they can't take the heat. They don't have a sense of humor about themselves. And they were destructive to his participation and left holes in all of these old comments threads of their own. So they were self-destructive, too. And now they've curled up into their cocoon. They want to listen to themselves. They want to be in the circle jerk. Well, fine. I think it's really, really lame. And I'm not sending them any more traffic, no matter how much they punch up. Yeah, I'm cutting them said off. That on your blog. Yeah, I cut them off. That'll teach them. No That'll more teach traffic them. for That'll you. That'll be the last time they ban me. Yeah. They won't be doing that again. Um, they don't deserve. Okay. The well, I haven't seen. I haven't seen the offending comments. Uh, you can't find them. I know that I know that he was accused of being a troll, and you would you would differ. But I haven't I haven't seen any, so I can't comment. But the, you know, um, when someone destroys the evidence, the presumption goes against them that it was. Yeah, well, you guys they should post the evidence because because you can still find the evidence through caches, right? That are done by through caching that's done yeah. by Google or somebody. We've linked to so that. So you should too. just 
You should post them all, and then we can all decide. You know what? I, I just don't want to give them that kind of attention. It's, you know, they, they, it's a victory of sorts if I'm giving them my time. I don't think they're worth it. So, you know, hmm. I'm cutting them off. Speaking of drinking, okay. they've had too much. They've had too much Altas, and it's time to it's your call. Up. No more Altas for you. <laughs> it's your call. That'll teach them. Yeah. I expect him to be on better behavior from here on out. So uh, where should we go from here? Oh, should we talk more about Wisconsin as long as we're deeply immersed in it? I guess we might as well. Well, let's switch to and Libya, then we can, and then, and then we, we can we, get back to Wisconsin. You, you want to do Libya? Some, well, I have let's a similar theme over, over Libya, which I told you before we started recording. Is uh, I just am looking for uh, – I, I want to hold the left to some coherence and consistency over this because Bush was criticized for, for taking us to war um, in Iraq, but Bush uh, made an argument to the American people – about why he was doing it. He was then pilloried because we didn't find weapons of mass destruction. But when did mm -hmm. Obama ever explain to us what, what do we, we still don't know? What are we doing? Well, Is it so afterwards he can say anything? He can claim that it was for any reason, whatever the facts after the fact show? That no, they, he actually has like a victory? rationale. Can okay, I, can I uh, give you my yeah. answer to that? Yeah. You want to hear some distinctions between him and Bush? <laughs> okay, first of all, this is, you know, not even a war in the sense that Bush's war was. Bush, Bush's was a huge ground invasion that, mm -hmm. as you know, wound up leading to the deaths of over 100,000 Iraqi, just massive thing, and, and thousands of American deaths. Mm -hmm. That was a true war, a ground invasion, mm -hmm. okay? Right. Th this is something that involves no ground troops, will involve no ground troops, has almost no chance of leading to the death of more than a couple of, of, of service people, conceivably, if, if another jet crashes or something. So yeah, the we sheer don't magnitude, put our lives it, on the line. We just kill them from afar. It's well, the whatever. But my point is the sheer. My point is that qualitatively and quantitatively, this is different. A, mm -hmm. B, this this intervention was authorized by the United Nations Security Council, which is a lawyer, you know, main, means that in terms of international law, it's actually lawful. Whereas Bush's was the opposite, the Security Council did not go along, so it was a it was it was a, a technically, in my view, illegal war he was launching. I hope, given these two facts alone, the magnitude and the illegality, he would have a word with the American people about why he's sending these people to their deaths. What's, uh, more, three, what's more important? Three. Than... Wait, can I just say one more thing? Yeah. Three. In this case. It all started with the Arab League, the, the relevant regional organization, asking the United Nations to do something, whereas those very same Arab states, uh, by and large, opposed what Bush was doing. So there's just yeah. like, I'm sorry, but no comparison between these two phenomena. And finally, Obama did do comparison. some explaining about why he was intervening. When did he do that? Did he ever sit down at a desk in the uh, Oval Office and, and look us in the eye and explain exactly why we were doing what we do. Do you ever commit to a reason the way Bush did? Of course, Bush was then uh, critiqued because uh, he identified one of the many, they had an array of reasons for doing it, and so he was often criticized that he had ulterior reasons and not the one he said, weapons of mass right. destruction. Uh, but he did select a reason and present it on that reason. That was then leveraged to criticize him later. But I don't, I, I don't think Obama has ever been coherent in presenting the reason. I certainly don't remember him no, looking he, us he in the eye. It. And what, did is there video somewhere? Uh, well, did I him, miss look, it? Look, Obama. No president has ever looked me in the eye, and personally, actually, I didn't mean to leave that aside. But, but did but, he but, ever but the, um, put his credibility on the line and look at us and say what we were doing? It seems to me he was in Brazil trying to do a photo op that was a complete fail. He, he repeatedly did explain uh, why he was doing it. Now, it's comparable to the Bush case in that undoubtedly there are other unstated motivations as well. Could you just the tell me what the reason was? Because I don't understand. Okay, what it can, you, you want to know? You want to know? I'll tell you. Yeah. The, the, uh, the Security Council acted on the basis of this concept of... Uh, what is it? Right to protect R2P? Is that it? The, 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 uh, the validity of intervening in a nation's affairs. Oh, responsibility to protect, maybe, when a, when a state is failing to protect its own citizens. Anyway. And that's the, the, the is that the Obama the rationale? That's what Obama, Obama, that was the rationale for the UN resolution, that it was a humanitarian intervention to keep innocent civilians from being killed by uh, Gaddafi, and he definitely was doing that, A. Uh, and B, that's what Obama said. Okay, he said, now, when, a leader, just, when a leader says that he's going to show his own citizens no mercy, 
you, you, you know, intervention is warranted. That's what Obama said. Can, That's the rationale. You, it's totally clear. Can you explain clear. to me how you do a humanitarian mission by dropping bombs from planes and never going in on the ground? How does that really work, number one? So how, I don't understand hey, that I'll as a military exactly venture. How it worked. I'll tell you exactly how it worked, okay? You know, we, and by the way, uh, I, 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 another thing Obama has been criticized for is not consulting with Congress. Well, let me, let me right. tell you about the that. number of lives it would have cost to delay this by even one day of consultation with Congress, okay? This is what I'm about to explain. But Obama dithered for three weeks. <laughs> Well, During we can get into that later. Gaddafi... We can get into that later if you want. But wait, you just asked. No, let, let me address your question mm -hmm. about humanitarian, how you do it with bombs, exactly the way we did it, okay? Uh, the, the city of, uh, oh, what's the name of the, the big city with like 700,000 mm -hmm. people in the east mm -hmm. that is the capital of, of, of the rebellion, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it'll probably come to me at some point. Um, when we got the Security Council authorization, when we finally, when the Arab League finally said, yes, please do this, Security Council went to town. At that point, Gaddafi's troops were approaching that city and were going to lay siege to it uh, until every, everyone mm -hmm. uh, was either, either dead, had fled, or had uh, converted to being a, 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 a Gaddafi uh, worshiper, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, now, we now have film, video of what was happening because one of the soldiers who was killed by one of the bombs you're talking about mm -hmm. had taken video with his cell phone of the ordinance that was being launched into the city, more or less indiscriminately. These are not like mm -hmm. guided smart weapons, mm -hmm. okay? They were being fired. This is like artillery. This is like big stuff. I would say at a rate of maybe 30 per minute. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were pouring this stuff into the city. This is the equivalent of Obama surrounding Cincinnati with artillery and just firing into it. I mean, it's the exact equivalent of that, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, because of the intervention, and only because of the intervention, we stopped them and rolled them back, and thousands of people in that city were saved. So as for your question about how do you do a humanitarian with bombs, the answer is exactly the way Obama did it, okay? Now, now it's a now complicated situation. Now, you just put that better than anything that I've heard from Obama. I've never heard him clearly well, state it like that. Look, he I agree. He was over I, in South America. That's he didn't true. Well, talk of course, that was a, that, don't don't that you think that he related to international um, organizations and not to America in a way that uh, is, is troubling, that he didn't involve Congress, that he didn't speak directly to us? I, I think there are probably a lot of calculations. First of all, the South America trip is long planned. And there's some cost to canceling this, to saying to a bunch of countries that, like most countries, already, you know, probably have a chip on their shoulder about America, with not, not irrational in all cases, but, but, you know, to say to them, oh, wait, we've got to cancel this. You know, I know you've got all your parades lined up, but, but sorry. You know, there's a real Brazil political cost. Supporting. He, you know, Brazil's but, kind of backed out of but, supporting us, right? No, I know. Uh, yeah. But, but who cares? I, I mean, the point is, there's a cost to delay. B. It's not clear to me that it makes sense to make a big deal of our intervention. Mm -hmm. One of the great things about this uh, is that because it is truly multilateral, mm -hmm. with the French in some ways leading the way, uh, the Arab League nominally on board, although there's some vacillation there, but actual military participation of a couple of Arab states, uh, is that it not only diffuses the diffuses the, the literal cost in terms of money, but, but the blowback, uh, you know, that you get from intervention in, in, inherently. So I don't think mm -hmm. it would have been smart mm -hmm. for Obama to draw international attention to America's role beyond what, what it already was. Mm -hmm. and, so, and I mean, that's so, the Obama way of doing uh, foreign policy. That's the Obama approach to the military. I'd like to see that really clarified and, and, and done in a really competent, clear way. Maybe it is a great idea. I'd like to see him prove that to us. If that's going to be the new way, as opposed to Americans are just going to react against it and say that was a disaster, we got to go back to cowboy mode, uh, you know, prove it to us. Make it work. Is, is well, he doing we'll that? This I don't is know. A dicey, this He's is losing a, dicey, a lot of people on the left, right? Some on the left and some on the right. It, it, it's, it's a co The supportive coalition is in some ways like the Iraq War coalition of liberal humanitarian hawks and, you know, neocons, mm -hmm. um, he, he's losing some people. I predict, I mean, it's a very dicey intervention, and there are, you know, there are several cities that right now are in play 
you know, w in other words, Qaddafi is, is being as brutal with them as he was starting to be with Benghazi. That's the name of the city yeah. um, that I couldn't remember. Um, and, uh, and it's not trivially easy by any means to, using air support only, uh, help the rebels turn the tide. But it looks to me as if the tide is being turned. I now think there's a good chance that this will be thought of as a policy success within a few weeks. But it's very dicey. So oh, that's, you know, that's me this, on Libya. This is one of the reasons I voted for Obama, is that I, I thought it would be good for the United States to have the Democratic side of the uh, political system uh, part of what we're doing in these foreign countries. I mean, I'm inclined to support the things the president thinks are necessary. I know a lot of people are just uh, partisan about that, or a lot of people are against all interventions, and some people want much more. But uh, I, I'm, I, I sort of welcome Obama doing something and showing us that it's confident and makes sense. Of course, he's creating a target for himself that a lot of people will say it's incoherent, and that's what they are saying. A lot of the uh, typical anti-war people uh, on the left are going to be saying what they, they always say. But, I, I mean, I think it may be good for us to get on the same page, like in the old days when, you know, politics stopped at the, uh, at the uh, borders, at the... Sure. The, the, um, I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm well, glad that, that this is happening. But on the other hand, I think there's room that uh, it might fail and leave a big opening for, uh, you know, people on the Republican side to say that we can't have this kind of internationalist politics and we need to be serving U.S. interests. What were the U.S. interests here? And, you know, if you're going to have a doctrine that's all about humanitarianism, then how can you explain all the times when you didn't use humanitarianism? Now, your right. argument, what you just said, made a lot of sense to me. It was because of the nature of the weapons that it was using. It wasn't like Rwanda where uh, there was just this uh, genocide done with machetes. Uh, right, let exactly. those people fight on their own with their own machetes. But if right. a leader is aiming these giant ballistic missiles at people, then uh, we need to come in there because... There's no way for the other side to fight. It's just an, uh, it's not a, it's a completely uneven slaughter. Right. So but that makes land, it a different yeah. humanitarian type thing. I, I, I really had not heard that put quite that way before. So um, uh, yeah. you should now, maybe be. Uh, it, it gets trickier once, once Gaddafi has gotten his tanks into a city. But even there, it turns out from the air, you can do a certain amount with, of course, somewhat greater risk of civilian casualties. But, but your larger point, I think, is right, is that the nature of this, uh, of Libya's situation, including the geographic nature, the fact mm -hmm. that he's got to roll tanks across desert, you know, mm -hmm. where they're very conspicuous, mm -hmm. um, makes it more amenable to an air-only um, intervention. So then is the doctrine that we do humanitarian interventions when we can do them from the air and predict that we won't have to send real human American bodies into the country? Yeah, maybe you could call that the Obama doctrine. Isn't it? Aren't, aren't there people he needs clamoring a doctrine. for him? <clears throat> Does he need, he a, needs doctrine? a doctrine? Does he need and, a and doctrine? And Charles Krauthammer is the official, you know, yeah, uh, looking at Charles giver Krauthammer. of doctrines. Yeah. He's but got I, a pretty I've got good a feeling column that today. Did you see his column today? The professor's war. I didn't see war. his column. What, what, did he, what did he say today? The professor's war. You know, he's it's similar to some of the things that uh, you're saying. This idea that he took three weeks to put together this international coalition. Uh, you yeah. know, and then it's falling over the Arab League. You know, the, the Arab League is already reversing itself, criticizing the use of force. And, you know, the Arab League uh, wasn't a particularly, unreliable, uh, particularly reliable organization in the first place. Um, you know, Brazil, China, Russia, NATO. He goes through the whole list of the, this international coalition that uh, Obama took three weeks to put together and how it's all falling apart now. And it's, you know, it's a war designed by an Ivy League professor, he says. Um, so, you know, that's, well, that's kind a, that's of what a, the critique is yeah. going to be uh, looking like. But, uh, you know, if all goes well, uh, Obama yeah. needs to prove that well, it will go well. And, I, I mean, it, does he need a doctrine is one of my questions. Should he be clearly stating what his doctrine is? I think you, I think you may have just articulated the Obama doctrine. I mean, well, like all of these he, doctrines. Don't you think he should be doing that? Rather than us, I mean, it's a little absurd. No, no, no. We're Charles, just hashing Charles it out and the, coming up with Charles a better Charles does the doctrines. Charles, I think, I think Charles defined the Reagan doctrine and the Powell doctrine. Charles Krauthammer. Now, often these turn out to be just common sense things. Like the Powell doctrine is like, if you're going to have a war, have plenty of troops, basically. Uh, you know, yeah. Um, although we we kind of failed in Iraq, actually, in the end. But but um, but and what you just said is in a way commonsensical. In other words. 
do humanitarian interventions when they're feasible, you know, at acceptable cost. But but that's as worthy as, as doctrinal st of a doctrinal status as, as the mm -hmm. Powell Doctrine is. So mm -hmm. I think Ann Althaus, you've just done it. I got you it have from named you. well. You, you, but uh, you might you not want to say that. There might be a reason not to say that doctrine because it sounds awful, frankly. I'll help you humanitarianly as long as I can do it from the air with bombs and I don't have to put any of my people at risk, including I kill a bunch of your ex innocent people along the way because I'm dropping bombs from a high uh, distance. Yeah, I mean, you don't really want maybe. to say that. I, I mean, know, but, it may but be he, there's a doctrine, but it can't be said because it just sounds too bad. If it were articulated, but, it could be criticized, so we can't. But humanitarianism and pragmatism are both independently positive things, and you may be right that when you put them together and talk about pragmatic humanitarianism, that somehow mm -hmm. turns against you, but... Right, because it's supposed to sound uh, it, It's the kind of humanitarianism I'm in favor of. I, I yeah. never intervene when the cost is unacceptable in my own humanitarian interventions. Is there is there American uh, self interest involved here? Or, because oh, there's I, failure I actually, to consult I Congress. Think you can make, yeah. Seems to me I that by can. failing to include Congress, you're you're implicitly making the assertion that it was needed to protect American national security. And uh, was that the case? Did he ever make that case? I don't see how that's true. Well, I think in a, in a lot, you could make a case. For example, uh, y if you believe as I do that it is in the long term interest of everyone. Uh, for these Arab autocracies to become, uh, to move toward democracy, to become more representative and, and, and leave fewer fr desperately frustrated people, especially young males of the mm -hmm. kind who, who can become terrorists. Um, uh, th if you believe that's in America's long-term interest, th then I think this intervention can be justified in that sense because, mm -hmm. you know, if, if Gaddafi succeeds in thwarting the will of the people, then, then, then that, you know, the rest of the Arab world is paying attention. But you can't that say that there's a national security emergency just because it's good long term to get more democracies in the world. That would well, be so open ended. That would, that would let the president take over everything. Where, where, what about the role of Congress? Shouldn't, well, shouldn't yeah, the but, president but again, acting we're... alone have to do with an, an emergency national security concern? And I don't see how we could characterize. Well, I didn't this say it was. A, I didn't say it was. A, I didn't say it was a national security emergency. I said there is a national security argument. Well, right, um, but I said it. But it's such a vague, long-term national security argument that it's very difficult to yeah. explain why the president is acting alone without the. Um, yeah, involvement but I do him. think, but I do think that rationale is responsible for some of the support that Obama has. I think there are some people who are thinking in exactly these terms. Well, uh, some of um, it is that the people in Congress don't want to have to involve it. You know, uh, Lindsey Graham was saying things like that. Oh, yeah, um, if he wants to come over and get a vote for him, I'd vote for him. But it, it's basically Congress uh, sloughing off and avoiding responsibility. That's the way the president uh, well, aggregates power as it is uh, defaulted on by Congress. Yeah, of course, this is a long-standing process. They're not saying anything. They're not criticizing. Who's going to criticize him? Not his own party, not the Republicans. They want to uh, get some uh, Democratic backing for more uh, right. military Right. Well, as a law professor, you're aware that the whole issue of Congress's role in military intervention, uh, <laughs> you know, I, 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 is, is kind of problematic. In other words, we, in theory, they're supposed to declare war, but I don't know how long it's been. We've had, I don't know how many wars since Congress actually declared one, right? When was the last time Congress actually declared war? World War II? World War II, isn't it? They didn't, it yeah. Was, it's the Korean War, we've Vietnam had, you know, War, those We've had Korea, things. Vietnam, Persian Gulf, Iraq, you know, it, it okay, just but, quit happening. Right. But there's still, you know? right, I mean, there's a, there's a historical realism that we can look at of Congress not claiming to have power and actually sort of enjoying and self-advantagingly allowing the power to slip away and run to the president. But the important thing to recognize is that if there are constitutional checks and balances, they're not there for the convenience of the people who happen to hold office in Congress. They're there to protect the people. There's a responsibility, mm -hmm. not just, oh, there's power if I can use it, but if I want to give it up, I, I can do that at my option. It's not their option. They have a responsibility. Right. They're in a position of trust. And if they're defaulting yeah. on it, that matters. Now, there's still the question, what is their responsibility? If they have a duty, what is it? But it's not, if they have a duty, it's not their option to say, I don't feel like doing my duty. It's something that's owed to the people. That's the constitutional point. Yeah. That's really important not to let slip away. It's not for members of Congress to say, 
oh, I'm happy with the president taking all the heat. That's mm -hmm. not acceptable. Well, here's a question. Why hasn't anyone ever, and they probably have, initiated action in the courts, in the judicial system, authorizing the legality of an undeclared war, yeah. and getting that the Supreme works. Court they, to tell us what, they what's happening? Oh, there were a lot of efforts back in the Vietnam era to drag the courts in. The courts had protected themselves with justiciability doctrines uh, and, and all what kinds of, well, uh, various doctrines about when a case is properly presented so that courts can deal with it, who brought the case, who are they suing. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, there's something called the political question doctrine. There are a bunch of doctrines. There's actually a whole course about it. I teach these things all the time. But, uh, you know, there are lots of ways for courts to avoid getting involved in things that they think are beyond the uh, manageability of the courts and that need to be fought out between the president and Congress. The, and, and war is basically one of those things. So if Congress doesn't step up and take that responsibility, there really is nowhere else to go other than into the political process, you know, like I'm doing right now, criticizing them for defaulting on their responsibility. You know, some of yeah. their constitutional values are protected in the political process. And I just really want to make the point that uh, there's a role for Congress, but if Congress defaults on that role, uh, as uh, Justice Jackson said in the steel seizure case from the Korean War era, uh, he quoted uh, Napoleon saying, the tools belong to the man who can use them. If the president picks up the tools and uses them, the idea that they're really Congress's tools hardly matters because the man who is using the tools, they're kind of, they've kind of become his tools. That's realism. And that's what the Supreme Court said in the, one of the few cases where it actually intervened and found something unconstitutional, but only because the President Truman had uh, seized the, the, uh, the steel, steel. Uh, mills, you know. So he had done something domestically that affected private property. But as far as all of these adventures overseas, the courts aren't going to do anything about that. People tried very hard during the Vietnam era to get the court to declare it uh, uh, illegal. And it absolutely mm -hmm. didn't work. So the idea but that the courts will be our salvation is ridiculous. Isn't isn't it's it not. a little alarming to you? <laughs> the, the general the general idea that fundamental you know constitutional principles can just fall by the wayside and kind of just nobody does anything about it, and then that becomes the new. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. what's yeah. what's the point? I mean, a lot of people would know. say that about federalism too. The courts have defaulted and left things to the deference of Congress. And as a result, Congress has gotten involved in all sorts of matters that were traditionally left to the states. And the judicial uh, doctrine is pretty much, uh, well, let Congress decide what should be left to the states. Yeah, if they well, want to do actually, something, actually, ahead, actually, no. I mean, actually, I mean, there are a lot of constitutional the... values that have gone by the wayside as the court picks and chooses a few things to pay extra attention to. But is that it, is I, the history my... of constitutional law. Okay, but my impression, as a lay person who actually rarely bothers to read these pieces anyway, but uh, uh, about this, but um, is that actually in contrast to the declaration of war issue, uh, the extension of federal power has has come to the courts every so often and has been explicitly justified on grounds of interstate commerce or whatever. That that's happened a number of times, hasn't right, it? As the court makes the doctrine, as the court makes constitutional right, right. law doctrine. In that case, a right, but that's what goes into that doctrine is a component of deciding how much to defer to Congress. So these ideas of oh. levels of scrutiny and deference to Congress, those are completely woven into constitutional law doctrine, which has to do with deciding the extent to which the courts are going to enforce these constitutional values. There could be much more enforcement, but the court politically can't do that much. There's a limited amount of judicial resource or political capital that can be done in the courts. And the courts have basically, through doctrine, carved out a role and decided, kind of retrenched and decided what, the, similar to uh, only not putting boots on the ground and only dropping bombs from the air. They're, they've thought mm -hmm. about what they can actually pull off successfully and frame their role so that it is about doing the things that they've decided they can do. And a lot of things have fallen by the wayside. A lot of things aren't done or are uh, there, there, there's rhetoric to the effect that they will be done by the other branches, which we can observe and see defaulting on that responsibility. That's the way it is. Uh, you can be troubled mm -hmm. about that or not, but it's it, talk about pragmatism and realism. That's, that's the story of constitutional law. And then, I mean, on this, vaguely on this subject, I sent you a link to a legal ruling, um, mm -hmm. a recent legal ruling. Uh, I, I forget the details. You may remember them, but it was basically... Is it a legal ruling, uh, or is it the rules uh, internal to the executive branch about uh, how they're going to 
when they're going to give Miranda warnings when they've got terror suspects. It, it is about Miranda warnings. I was yeah. thinking it was a legal ruling, but you you may be right. In any event, the, the administration the, is, oh, apparent, yeah. is, is apparently successfully uh, taking a, a kind of a shortcut that was supposed to be confined to true emergencies, right? In other words, if there is looming peril to someone, then you can wait a while before you read the person the Miranda rights, mm -hmm. okay? And they're extending that to cases of terrorism broadly when, as we know, many cases of terrorism don't evolve. Any so they can gather peril. intelligence in, instead of getting the person into a position of lawyer-protected silence. I mean, right. the intelligence with respect to uh, finding out what's going on with this war, this war against us, this terrorism mm -hmm. war, right? Uh, when right. you catch somebody, you want to use him to extract information, not so get him lawyered up and silent. I mean, what really matters there? And, you know, the constitutional law rules in the area are are shaped in part by ideas about needs and emergencies and so forth. So when you're talking about, um, I mean, there's just room to make arguments, and, and this is the groundwork for making those arguments about what we need to do. And, and as far as statements that people make, it can simply be that if, they, if we were going to try them in a criminal trial, these statements that they made before they were given the warnings would be excludable. But there's also the problem of the, you know, if you then... Uh, get to additional material because of what they said, that stuff will all, that evidence will also be uh, excludable. So there's some procedural matters that may be less important than uh, the issue of what will be admissible at trial. Now, it never even comes up if you don't uh, have criminal trials with these uh, people. If you go through military trials, maybe you can have a different rules of evidence, and maybe you can just detain these people indefinitely, and maybe you can just shoot them, as Justice Frankfurter said uh, many years ago. Uh, you know, they are your uh, uh, enemy combatants, right? Uh, yeah. So, so the uh, rules are different at war, is what I'm saying, and the interests of the United States are different. Now, Obama has said that he wants to have more criminal trials, but, you know, where are these criminal trials? And he is uh, manipulating the rules. with res He's not treating the terror terrorism suspects in the same way as no, ordinary and, and you criminals. <clears throat> and on Blogging Heads TV, I think you predicted uh, near the outset of his administration that he'd wind up backing off on a lot of this stuff. Certainly, and that's why I, that's one of the reasons I voted for him. He's, this is what I wanted. You see, he's disappointing yeah. his left supporters, but he's doing what I wanted. I wanted to bring the Democrats in so that they would get committed to these things instead of you know, taking pot shots from a distance. So wait, well, so wait, you mean, you mean on the civil li liberties issues, well, where do you stand on this stuff? So you, you, you don't want to see the, the, the proceedings uh, move to criminal court. You don't want to see Guantanamo close. What, yeah. is, that, is that your position? I, don't, I, I support Obama, uh, um, Guantanamo remaining open. I think the, en the enemy combatants that are being detained need to have a procedure, but it should be in the form of military commissions, which is what Bush was starting to do. And Obama suspended, I think, when he first came in, and then he experimented with starting to do things uh, in the federal courts as if they were ordinary crimes, and he hasn't been able to do it. Now, it's hard for him to get back to the Bush position, but I think that's where he's going to end up, and I think that that will be a good thing. Both parties will then be committed to, and Bush, in retrospect, you know, will be rehabilitated. I mean, that's, I don't so, really care whether so Bush voted, is honored so in you the voted, end, but I you voted, voted for Obama. For yeah. You voted for Obama because you were confident that once he took office, he would cease to be Obama and would become more like Bush. Well, I mean, I wanted to You voted to see for Obama but, uh, because... Obama you, is you, like Bush is one of my blog tags. You know, you can click on that tag and see how I've been talking about that all along. But, you know, if, if McCain were struggling with all of these things right now, what a mess it would be uh, with the left still standing at a distance taking pot shots from... Uh, Tens of thousands well, of people. Well, the left is yet. taking pot shots. I mean, to their credit, including me. I, I'm not happy about a lot of these yeah. policies. Glenn Greenwald right. is, is not, right. not a convert to the Obama right. way. And, and I think that this is good. I think it's good. Well, the uh, Democratic uh, Party is not monolithic. So uh, you're peeling off the people who were right. further to the left, the anti war crowd. And there is a core, which obviously the Democratic Party needs, to, needs in order to get a majority or anything close to it which is the ordinary people in the middle, like me, who uh, want to be realistic and practical about national interests and national security. And we see uh, Obama has to uh, do the things that need to be done to keep us in the group. And I think that hmm. going through this uh, four years, whatever mistakes and horrible things are going on, uh, 
there would have been other mistakes with McCain, but I think there's something really healthy about going through this exercise and getting the Democratic Party, the Democratic president, um, agreeing with many of the things that he himself and mm -hmm. other Democrats stood at a distance and criticized Bush for doing. I think it's very healthy for the American political system. Yeah, well, I disagree. But if we're going to, uh, if we're going to get to Wisconsin, we should get to it now, probably. Okay. Um, did and, you see? Uh, did you read my death? Did you read the death threat I got? I, you know, technically, I mean, it was creepy, but technically it wasn't a death threat. I mean, technically, I've actually got it here when, where when he addresses the question of violence explicitly, he says what he says in closing. Look, it's a totally creepy thing and what we can link to it. And, 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 and in my rare brushes with things like this as a journalist, I can attest there's no fun when you get the sense that there's somebody out there who wants to make you the subject of violence. But what he does say at the end is, to, this is to you and me. It's this weird, weird, semi-coherent screed. He says, pay your dues or action will be taken, talking to you and your husband. Mm -hmm. The action will be legal, peaceful, and nonviolent. And then in parentheses it says, on our end anyway, if you want to do it the other way, fine with us. Meade is a tough guy on LGM, meaning lawyers, guns, and money again, or, or whatever, but he's a, yeah, yeah. a chicken shit uh, in, IRL stands for in real life. Oh, since I you guess. said we, chicken shit, we I dare you, buddy. Double dog dare you. So in other words, they're saying, go ahead, you throw the, the first punch. Oh uh, well, that, that's this in is there. technical. What? Yeah. What? That's in there. But there's also the part where they say we will fuck you up. In capital yeah, they letters. do, but that doesn't necessarily mean. You know, that can mean a lot of things. There is there well, are threats often. Who, <laughs> threats are often. <laughs> yeah. Look, I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to interpret some thing. ridiculous screed that some uh, young yeah. man, a uh, 30-year-old man, actually, he's not a kid. Yeah. Some a 30-year-old man, and he signed mm -hmm. his name to it. I mean, I think what's right. more important. Can I just say, yeah. I think that something that's more important than whether this particular person intends to carry out this threat is number one. Uh, it creates this atmosphere of hatred that's so far beyond Sarah Palin and her targets yeah. of the uh, campaign that it, it, it creates hatred against us that other people can take the wrong way and decide we are the, my husband and I are the evil people in Madison yeah. who need to be driven out of town because that is the theme of it, that we don't belong in the town. Number one, it could influence other people and it creates this atmosphere of hatred even if this individual thought he was being funny or uh, was uh, doing some goofball uh, creative writing exercise yeah. that he thinks is cute. Uh, but secondly, um, uh, 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 it also shows the ugliness of the rhetoric that is the norm within the cocoon of these people who've been uh, standing around beating drums and chanting uh, in their occupation of the state capitol building, uh, which well, the occupation is over, but this thing has been going on, it still goes on every day, has been going on yeah. for six weeks. Uh, these people are inside a cocoon, inside an echo chamber, and you can see the kinds of things that they're saying to themselves uh, I'm getting it against me and my husband, but uh, uh, certainly against the legislators, against the governor. I don't know if you saw the death threat that they got, but that one uh, no. claimed that they were going to put bombs everywhere, that they were going to kill their children, that they knew where the children went to school. This was against all of the re uh, Republicans in the uh, legislature. Uh, so this mm -hmm. is really ugly stuff. I've been photographing and documenting the kinds of signs, the kinds of chants, oh. all, all of these okay. comparisons and, of the governor and, and, to Hitler and so forth. And so uh, what I want to just show and what I'm trying to do with this new media effort that we're doing here that the mainstream media is missing is how unbelievably ugly and vicious and absolutely the antithesis of any kind of civility that Obama and others argued for after the Tucson massacre that it's just mind-blowing and I wish people would look I wish people would see how horrible and ugly what is going on within this closed circle of an echo chamber okay. of the left wing that's here in Madison Wisconsin and it's more okay. than, I mean, it's also, it's not just the left wing, it's all kinds of just public uh, union of people. And by the way, I'm one of the people who is affected by the, by the budget repair bill, and I, I'm going to lose a lot of money myself, but go on. Um, we can make it up blogging, as you know. That's a, that's a lucrative enterprise. Oh, um, I'm raking it in over here. But, you know, I've gotten a lot of spontaneous donations on my PayPal button. A lot have of, you? you know, every, yeah, I, I continually get people giving me $10, $20, $50, $100. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, I mean, maybe it's the Koch brothers under, uh, it, it could joke. be. Do you understand it the Koch be. brothers jokes? I mean, this, this is something that uh, is local to Wisconsin. Oh yeah. No, I know the Koch brothers. I mean, I heard the, I heard the, 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 the 
scam played on Scott Walker and everything. I'm still waiting called, for the... <laughs> yeah, to be yes, coke. Yeah. But, but, um, but, but, okay, so just for purpose of background, this is the kind of thing that got you this thing that you're... The, the, that, the, this very threatening screed that this guy uh, yes. that wrote. Yes, we are uh, photographing. It, it was because of your involvement in... in uh, in kind of documenting mm -hmm. the kind of hate, the kind of hate speech mm -hmm. or whatever, the, the kind of ugly yeah. side mm -hmm. of these demonstrations in Wisconsin. And also, there's an um, idea that you don't you know. I see where your address is. By the way, they published my address. I see where your address right. is. Do you know where you live? You live in Madison, Wisconsin, and you're not the. the don't you know what Madison, Wisconsin is? Basically, we are all a big group uh, of uh, people of like-minded people, and you don't belong here. And we're and unless you give. Five thousand dollars to all these various uh, left-wing groups that they want us to, that they're trying to uh, tell us. We, we're going to run you out of town whenever we see you. And, and they named various uh, restaurants and coffee shops and stores that we would patronize here in Madison, Wisconsin. We, we're all, we we all work here. We're the people that live here. We know who you are. We're going to put up wanted posters about you. We're going to surround you. We're going to come and uh, stand outside your house. And here's the address. And we're going to hound yeah. you until you live because you let don't me, belong here. You're quote. not allowed to live here. He says, we will throw our baseballs in your lawn, you cranky old pieces of shit, and then we will come get them back. What are you going to do? Shoot us? Give yeah, blah, I know blah, that, blah? Yes, there is uh, a theme the, the, that we're going to do legal things until we right, piss you off right, to the point right. where you're going to go over the line, and then we'll be able to fuck you up because okay. uh, we'll be in self-defense. There is so that here's theme. A, yeah. So here's but the, a question. But it's an ugly, they are doing things with words, okay. but don't so, words so, okay, count? So, so Anne, so wait, so wait. So here's a question. You, by your own account, what you went in with, with, is... You know, you go into these things with the intention of documenting uh, the underside, the ugly underside, because you, you thought it needed exposing, okay? And no, I, because and I it was that down the street from us, and I go, if anything's fine, happening in town, fine. I go there with my camera, That's and wonderful. I see what Let I me finish. See. Right, but I have a question. Okay. Uh, and, and I presume that means that, that the things you took pictures and videos of were not randomly selected. You, you think the ugly part needed exposing. Now, no, when you know, the, Bob, I know you know, didn't wait, Can I finish? Can I finish? Can yes. I finish, Ann? Yeah, when the allegedly liberal, when the allegedly liberal media did the same thing with Tea Party movements, in other words, they said, "Here's the news: is the ugly part." The posters where they they call Obama some you know racial epithet or some whatever. Mm -hmm. They were criticized for what it sounds to me thing. like yeah. is doing what you in this context are saying is doing God's work, right? Well, if you go back. Through the six weeks on my blog where I have, I have material every day, videos, pictures, you will see that I didn't just, uh, you know, parachute in, find the ugliest thing, and then leave and show that and say, aha. Well, neither, I neither have, did wait, the let liberal me, media. Bob, let me finish. I have been, I and my husband have been going there every day. We take a lot of pictures, and we show things that we find interesting. Much of it is positive. Meat goes in uh, and, and stands in the rotunda now that they're not chanting, talks to people. He interacts with them, and, and if you go into the blog, you will see that it is in a very civil way. It is in the interest of having dialogue, and when people come off looking good, we show that too. We have been showing a lot of texture to, to what it really looks like when, when you're here, and it isn't just this parachute in take one thing and leave and try to make it look as bad as possible. We are not doing that, and I don't accept that characterization of what, what we're doing. We're doing something of well, providing lots of coverage and showing lots of people. And, it, you know, when people look good, uh, we, I, I have found the signs that I think are, are cool, uh, uh, people who uh, look very attractive while they're doing that. I, I, I go to what is interesting. I've been blogging for, for over seven years and with the camera much of the time, and I'm always looking for things to photograph. I mean, to me, this is like the photo op of a lifetime because finally I can take pictures of people. Because normally, it's you can't just aim your camera at somebody even when they're in public, very uh, with very good etiquette. Uh, but here, these are people who want to be seen. They're proud of themselves. I'm showing what they are. Uh, and to me, number one, it's that something is happening in my city, and yeah. uh, and I can photograph it all. I love that. And I'm going on what's interested. I'm going on showing much, much greater coverage because I'm here. And that's what I'm doing. And I think if you go over my blog, you'll find the ugliest things too. But I, I don't think, I mean, it's absolutely wrong to compare me to those parachute in cherry pickers of well, mainstream I media. Think, we are I not it, doing that. I think, it, I think there probably aren't many cases where you had mainstream so-called liberal media parachuting in and, and doing only the ugly side of the Tea Party rallies. I, 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 I doubt that. Now, there were uh, ideological blogs that picked out left-wing blogs that picked out only those parts to highlight. And I'm sure there are probably right-wing blogs that are picking selectively on the material you're generating. Mm -hmm. But 
Um, I, I, you know, I, I think in both cases, it's, I'm not criticizing either of you. It is natural. It is, it is to the extent that, I, you know, and again, I, I was just following your own account. You introduced this whole thing by saying what you were doing was exposing the ugly side. I didn't make that up. You said that that was your emphasis, and, and you may be right. It's more because symmetrical well, that's than that what sounded. Because found, Fine. by and large. Fine. And, you know, I mean, and another thing is these are people who are proud of their, there have been so many signs Comparing Governor Scott Walker to Hitler, and we and we've been documenting well, that from the beginning. We have gone, yeah. and these people are proud of that. And when you go up and talk to them, they explain why they're saying that. Uh, they stand by what they're doing. They're surrounded yeah. by thousands of people, and so it's not like one person with a nasty sign and the other people right. aren't really associating we've, themselves. We've with seen this. We've they're seen this on the right, and now. We've seen this on the right. We're seeing it on the left. I understand the it, phenomenon. You know, again, I, I know what we're seeing here is a thousand times beyond what was gathered at Tea Party. Uh, you, you need to see this to believe it. You need to see the mutual reinforcement. Well, you, you need know, to I see the say, thousands of people that stormed the Capitol, that occupied it, that slept in it night after night, mm -hmm. that that stood in the rotunda of this beautiful building that had. And, and, and banged on pickle uh, barrels and chanted, yes. whose house, our house, and this is what democracy looks like. When they were the losing side in the last election, they're trying to overturn the results of the last election. They had the marble well, walls on, of the Capitol come covered on, in well, ugly well, signs that were taped up. It was a a, a surreal, and, nightmarish and, environment. And, 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 can I interrupt? Did you, did, and tell me, I may, it may be the case, did Scott Walker, while running for government, say, I'm going to take away the right to collective bargaining from public employees? Did he say that? If not, then the election was not a mandate on this issue, and it's not accurate to say what you just are, are said. Are you going to criticize Obama when he, did, did Obama uh, say that? And you're dodging the do issue. Come on, we're talking about Wisconsin. Would you please answer the question? He said Did things Scott, that were... You just, you just said, look, they lost the election, so they have to cave on this issue as if the election was a mandate on this issue. If Scott Walker didn't say, no. I'm going to well, take away the right to collective bargaining, it was not a mandate. The details of when someone is elected to office, they haven't presented items on a referendum that they are then, you know, unless it's Newt Gingrich with the contract uh, for America... Uh, they don't give the items so that you can say his election is a mandate to do all of these things. There's so many, many complexities to why you vote for one candidate in favor right. of another. My main reason for voting for Scott Walker was I was opposed to the high, to the high speed uh, rail between Madison and Milwaukee. That was just uh, I was almost a one issue voter on that. That was overwhelming to me. But once they're in office, yes, you can still keep talking to them and debating mm -hmm. about what the policies are. You can't just say, oh, he was elected, so he gets to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Although I remember Obama saying, we won, and ramming yeah. the health care reform down our throats. It's sort of like, ah, don't we get to keep talking? And Actually, the Tea Party that's very movement was all about He's, that. But, and uh, but, he said, but the difference is, he said he would do it when he was running for election. And then he did it. That's the uh, difference. Not in, he did. Uh, I don't think the, the broad, uh, you know, there are there are generic general things that are said, and then you see the details of it. We didn't see what the details of the health care reform was until after it was passed. In fact, famously, and at, at which Pelosi point says it was you'll have to pass it, it to find out what was in it. So obviously, he didn't campaign on all those details. He didn't even know the people who signed that thing didn't even know what all the details were. But putting that aside for a moment, what I want to say is I do agree that after someone is elected, that the people who who, who, whose candidate didn't win certainly have a role to play in continuing the public debate and the political pressure as this, mm -hmm. these candidates think about what's going to happen in the next election and try to shape policy. Sure, they should participate, but this is but participate to the extreme of occupying the Capitol and 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 chanting endlessly the same things over and over. You know what's disgusting? Union busting. You, this, these things were said were yelled at high decibel levels to the detriment of the eardrums of the people that have to work in the building uh, mm -hmm. for hours and hours on end, all day long, sleeping in the Capitol, putting signs all over the Capitol. Scott Walker is Hitler. This is all over the Capitol. It's not normal debate. It's not the way you try to persuade. It's completely divisive. It's completely yeah. weird and intimidating. And if you supported Scott Walker and you tried to walk into that situation and, and present yourself uh, that way, you could be hounded when Meade went into the crowd with his... Uh, camera and tried to talk to people and just interview people about what they thought 
uh, there would be, there was one point when uh, people started to say, are you a walker plant? And then a word got around, uh, he's, is he a walker plant? He's a walker plant. And this mob got around him and a guy, uh, you know, basically assaulted him, grabbing his camera. He had to fight, he had to get it back. And there were, there was just this sort of seething mob around him. We have video of that because the camera ran through the whole thing. It was a completely intimidating environment if you wanted to present the other side. It was yeah. just weird. It was not normal political debate and persuasion. It was a show of, uh, you know, basically uh, well, being on the verge of violence. The, the verbal violence and intimidation was extreme. When the doors were, were closed on them after there was a court order saying that people couldn't sleep there anymore overnight, they stormed the building. They kicked through door panels, valuable, uh, you know, e expensive wooden doors with these big uh, brass hinges, uh, this building that's mm -hmm. 100 years old. Uh, we have photographs of the hinges, of uh, the doors, windows and doors being broken, people uh, storming into the bu building, overwhelming the police. The police had to retreat. Uh, yeah. But it's well, a I'm a, Look, I'm against intimidation. You know, it's bad. Uh, there is a, a final thing I'd say about this. There is one distinction that may or not, may not be consequential between these people and the people who are behaving in extreme fashion uh, under the label of Tea Party or whether they were typical or not and, and disrupting uh, public events. Um, I, I think the difference is these people at least uh, understand clearly what they are actually fighting against, whereas I think a certain number of the disruptive people at the, at the, at the, uh, in the case of health care had been misled as to what the contents were by phrases like death panels. They thought, oh, my God, you know, they, they imagined that, like actual death panels. I think all these people know exactly well, what's going I, I on. I think a lot Who of them, to, you know, you know of, a lot of them don't understand that the collective bargaining problem that Walker is addressing is specifically with respect to to public employees, employees. Mm -hmm. and and really? I don't that think seems they, so simple. I can't believe they, that's not out no, there. They, they basically understand that, but they don't understand the dynamic and the detail. I wish you would do a blogging heads on this. I mean, there's a cover story on the new uh, Reason magazine. I was just looking at that. Uh, you might want to get the the. Who wrote it? But uh, uh, I haven't opened it up yet. I, I'm planning yeah. to read it right after I get up. But uh, um, you know the dynamic. You know Franklin Roosevelt was said that. Uh, it was, was against public it was incoherent. Employees. There yeah. is a dynamic between the unions and union dues and contributions to the Democratic Party and inside favors to the to the uh, burgeoning public employee uh, population that is a dysfunction in politics that ought to be understood. And I think people are not settling down and thinking uh, coherently about what's going on there. People are just uh, kind of affiliating with a political group that this is mm -hmm. what the good people think, which is my overarching you know, criticism of people on the left. And by the way, they've also branched out into other, the, the sort of hangers on, the dead enders that are continuing the protests. A lot of them are verging into the anti-war and uh, socialism. There's outright uh, communist slogans. There's communist graffiti, workers of the world unite on our uh, our civil war monument that uh, we have a video of well, me trying to clean that off. I mean, there's a, a hardcore left wing a faction that is well, actually wait, detrimental. Workers of the World Unite was a communist slogan, but it's not inherently a communist principle. You can imagine an international labor union that's not communist. Uh, it's a it is a famous quote from the Communist Manifesto. Yes, it's, very it's not good graffiti. If I was interested in promoting the uh, valid and mainstream interests of publicly, public employee unions. First of all, I wouldn't put graffiti on a Civil War monument. But second of all, I wouldn't use a communist slogan. So there yeah. is a very left faction that has actually. flowed in to the space that's been created. And it's not, uh, so it's not a monolithic group. On the first days of the protest, it was really the teachers. You know, in fact, the mm -hmm. schools were closed. The teachers had a sick in, and there was a whole thing about okay. teachers not going to the, but these were, you know, middle class people, actually people with very good jobs. I mean, it's kind of ironic for the left to be involved in something that's about preserving the privileges of mm. people who are better off than the average citizen. That's yeah. kind of weird. Okay. But then okay. now, as it's it's transmogrified over time, I mean, there's been evolution of who's here in this crowd over time. And a lot of what's going on now are the locals, communists and socialists and peace movement people. And uh, okay. it, and it's, it's, it's really a different group that it's changed into. Okay, we've been doing this about an hour. Let me just say two quick things. One is, uh, as far as us doing a blogging heads on this, if there's somebody that you disagree with, 
you know, you should let us know. We'll try to set something up between you and them. Secondly, we're about out of time. I, I, I hate to abuse my, uh, no, my abuse away. status, but I, di I did want to get into this issue of my grievance with you, you know. My, Grieve what away. I allege, what I allege is your misrepresentation of my views. Okay. Um, I'm sorry. You know, last time we argued about uh, Glenn Beck, and I said, you know, I don't remember exactly what I said. It was something to the effect that Roger Ailes should be ashamed of himself for letting Glenn Beck, at, Beck on the air. I think Glenn Beck says yeah. things about people that are inaccurate and that can lead to, that, that are untrue. He lies, mm -hmm. and, and, and we know they're untrue, and they mm -hmm. could lead and demonstrably have led mm -hmm. to people uh, being targeted by people who want to kill them. I mean, in other words, he tells lies about people that incite violence against them, and yeah, that I made said, me I wonder why you weren't more concerned about the death threat that I received. I mean, you kind of brushed that off as being... No, no, I said it's very serious. It's just not technically a death threat. But anyway, let me finish. And I've gotten things exactly like that, that weren't quite literally death threats, but were really not, that were really unsettling in exactly that way. But, mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't minimize it, but, but on this point... Um, mm -hmm. the, uh, and look, I condemn that exactly the way I condemn Roger Ailes, Anne. I don't approve of that. I mean, that's mm -hmm. my point, is, is what I said about Roger Ailes was, you know, uh, I condemn it. I think it's immoral. I think people should condemn him giving Glenn Beck a platform. But mm -hmm. I am not in favor of the government restricting, telling Roger Ailes what to do or telling Glenn oh, Beck oh, I to get off. I was very clear. And then you characterized my view on your blog, right. as anti-free speech. Right. And my complaint about that was mm -hmm. that many people, and probably most, but certainly many, when they see anti-free speech, they think it is someone who is favoring government restri restrictions right. on speech, which I was emphatically yeah. not. And, and I and think I was clear about that I understood that and that I... I you were not in the Post. You were not in the Post. No. The Post misled people. And in fact, Anne, you know, in my uh, argument well, I, was, look, I, I, I mean, I think I've always been clear that free speech means something more than the right to free speech that you can enforce on courts. Refer back to what I said earlier about what courts enforce. Obviously, the right in the Constitution has to do with things the government can't do. But free speech as a value goes beyond that. There are a lot of corporate gatekeepers to speech. I was blogging about what Apple did in, uh, in censoring an app that had mm -hmm. been made uh, for... Mm -hmm. um, for the iPhone, and I think that we, and like, look how Google, look at all the power Google has. If we don't talk about free speech in a broader way. And that, that's all fine, and we should, and we can, we can, you can define your terms however you want. However, if it's a fact that a substantial number of the American people and readers of your blog uh, think of anti-free speech, because it's the way it's commonly used, to, to mean government, favoring government restrictions mm -hmm. on speech, and you just qu quickly call me anti-free speech, you're misleading them about well, my I'm position because that rhetoric, is the way the term speech. is used. I'm what? engaging in rhetoric about speech, and anytime you want to stop and talk about the argument that free speech only relates to things that the government does, I'm willing to engage and talk on that, but I'm part of so you, a persuasive dialogue in which I'm saying free speech means more than that. I'm going to keep saying that. You're not going to push me back on that. Fine, but do, do you deny that... i that subject anytime you want. But I'm not going to stop you... using that term the way I do. I'm, do. I'm part of trying to define the term in the broader way, and I'm going to keep okay. doing that. Do you deny that you were misleading some of your readers about my views? Yes. Okay. Well, here's a comment from, from somebody who reads your blog, and they yeah. say, referring to me, Remember that leftist blogger that Althaus was debating on blogging heads after the Tucson killings? He seemed to be pretty gung-ho on speech restrictions. Well, in fact, if you watch what I said, I was emphatically, explicitly against speech restrictions, but you described my position in a way that led him to believe exactly the wrong thing. So you did mislead at least one person, Anne. So every time someone reads something and doesn't understand the details of it, the person who wrote it is responsible for the way that person misunderstood it? I mean, I wouldn't speak at all if I felt that much responsibility for my speech. It would be yeah, dangerous but Anne, to say if it. the way a term is commonly used, you know, it, it, 
uh, uh, would miss would lead people to have the if you use a term that if understood the way it is commonly understood will mislead people about somebody's position yes I think that's irresponsible I and always this, in layer fact, in is the, the detail way, I always layer in the detail about that I, I, I in that post I will you did say not more. you did not you well, did I'll not, go back you did and not. Look at people it. can go back and read the post you did not well any t you, I, I'm I'm in you know words have lots of different meanings and for you to say there's an evolution of what words mean to say that oh there's a prime meaning for this term it must always be used that way and anytime you use it with the secondary or third meaning you try to shape what that word means uh, you're being deceptive I'm not going to buy into that more general idea about how people have to speak okay. by the way I'm well, hearing anyway. an echo of my own voice in the phone and it's uh, I'm hearing myself yelling in my own ears. Really yeah, we're kind of breaking up a little. <laughs> can you can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you, but my, I'm maybe. hearing myself on a slight delay. Uh, so. Oh well, maybe you should just let me do all the talking then. Yeah, go ahead. Rave on. Uh, well, I you know just I, I I've said I've said my piece. I mean, I think language uh, is is something that. Uh, <laughs> You use to be understood clearly. In, in my view, if you're a journalist, that's your obligation. How did language and, and that ever means, come to And that exist? means if you're going to use shorthand to describe something, you, you have a responsibility to be attentive to the way the terms are going to be understood. Let me just finish. There are a substantial number of people who take anti-free speech to mean in favor of government restrictions on speech. And, and you could have easily described my position in a way that didn't mislead so many people, including this particular reader. It might have been less provocative, but my own view is if there's a trade-off between provocative and accurate, okay. you, you know, and to accurate in the sense of conveying accurately what people may, let me give you go an with analogy. accurate. Let me give an analogy. Let's say yeah. someone wrote uh, an, an op-ed against affirmative action. And then I wrote a blog post saying that they were against equality because my definition of equality had to do with making up for a, a past uh, lack of an even playing field. And you were trying to do something affirmative to create a more substantive idea yeah. of equality. Now, I would be embracing a secondary meaning of equality. Would that be yeah. deceptive or would that be good no, that's rhetoric? No, that's fine. And if you go on and explain, that's fine. That's exactly what you didn't do in this case. Well, I, I mean, I have to go back and look at that post. If you want to uh, participate with me and send me an email, I would add an update. If you say you've written about me in a way that I think is wrong, here's this point. I would publish your email. I would respond to that. I would put that in an update. So it's an ongoing dialogue, and I would invite yeah. you to participate with me there rather than and, just seeing and as you somewhere. Recall, as you may recall, we had an extended email correspondence about this during which you yielded no ground. <laughs> we wrote thousands of words about this already. I mean, well, yeah, I mean, what I, do you I mean? wish I had thought. I, I, have, I have found so that I emailing you about you. this is completely fruitless. Okay, well, I, I will do a blog post about it and put. I mean, I, I wish I had put it in an update to the post. Then I could, if you had said, could you put that in a, in the post? I would have done that. But I think we went okay. back and forth. I didn't remember it having to do with a post. I thought it was about. The, uh, the blocking heads itself, which is hard to go and tweak and add to the arguments that you mm -hmm. made right on the spot during the, uh, during the Yeah, we're breaking up. We're breaking up when enough. When you were hearing your voice in your ear and in a way that's driving me crazy. I, I'm, I'm actually just having trouble hearing you. I'm not hearing my own voice. So oh, maybe okay. this is God's way you. of saying we should sign off. I mean, I have aired my grievance, and, and, uh, and we've talked for over an hour, and those are my two main objectives getting well, up this morning. Can I use your email in a post? Would you consent to that? Uh, I'll tell you what. If you want to print um, the entire exchange, yeah, I do guess. It. Sure, that's that's what I would like I to mean, do. I uh, mean, you know, I should go back and see whether I, I like. Whether you really want I don't want think to. I did. I didn't say anything super untoward, did I? Um, Ooh, no, uh, I'd be happy no. with you. I, I think it'd be fine and edifying to, sure, to, to, to print that. the whole exchange, not yeah. part of it. Yeah, I'll do that. I'm really not trying to, suppre uh, to, to be deceptive about that point. I don't want to say that you're, you're for... Uh, <laughs> I think that corporate repression of speech matters, don't you? Uh, you're breaking up, but I, mm -hmm. I... So I don't know if I agree with you. at <laughs> and you, you said, the you corporation said you wants us to matters. shut up. <laughs> what? Say I what? said a corporation, AT and T, would like us to shut up. <laughs> I think They're trying so. to repress I think, us. <laughs> I think Apple probably knows your position on the Apple apps. What if the phone to... company had a way to find out when you were saying the wrong thing and they cut off your phone connection? 
Um, you know, I think some authoritarians actually have software. Apparently, uh, people in China, when they use the word protest, have found that there's a tendency for the conversation to end. And, and I yeah. took that to mean there's like software. Well, I'm sure in China, um, but, the government owns the phone company. But what yeah. if A&T could do that? Well, or what if uh, what happened during the Bush administration happens again, which is the phone companies crumble when the administration says, we want to use your infrastructure to spot on people. And they gather all this information, and it's just sitting there, and if they ever want to cooperate with the government, it all goes to the government. Yeah. We've got to worry about that, don't we, in the new world? I mean, Google is sort of infesting everything, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you're breaking up again, and we're, we've gone on a while. So thanks for hearing me out on my grievance, and I agree, transparency is always the solution. Okay, and sometimes. I'll be transparent about our email exchange. Right on, brother. Okay, I will do the uh, press, so you know, just, just you wait. <laughs> okay, well, enjoy Wisconsin. I hear it's lovely it's this a time a of year. It's a playground out here. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, okay. take care, Ann. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.